this on? Good. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is The Chap, and I'm afraid I can't resist buying rubies. All right, feel much better now I've got that off my chest. We all have our deep, dark secrets. So, uh, welcome to the workshop for an episode dedicated to my little ruby collection. Um, I don't know why I find these little pistols fascinating. Uh, they have a rich history. And um, as we all see, they are not, in fact, all created equal. Um, so what I'm not going to do is go into the whole history uh, of the ruby pistol with regards to France. Um, now, if you want to have a sort of a vague theoretical overview of what happened, please head over to uh, CN Arsenal. They have a, a, an episode there dedicated to the ruby. However, here we at Bloke and Arrange are privileged uh, to have footage of the original negotiations that went down between France and Spain. So this is what really happened. So here they are in all their glory. I'll try and zoom in on uh, some of the markings. Some of them are a bit faint and I've had to identify simply by the two or single letter codes on the heel. So I hope you'll be able to see something in this light. And uh, if not, then I'll just add it in text. A lot of them have a little trade name, so this one is uh, Ideal. And this one is quite interesting. Uh, this one is from Bonifacio Echevarria, Izara, uh, which means star, and they are also the ones that made this. So they are the star company. So they hedged their bets, providing more than one alternative. Now this one is Elustondo Otiaga. Interesting, this is one of the two I have which are not um, stamped A bar. Uh, these ones are from Guernica, a bit further down the road. And I apologize if my pronunciation is not up to Spanish or Basque uh, standards. And this one is interesting because it's, uh, it's a bit misleading. Les ouvriers réunis, piste automatique, action numéro 2. Uh, looks like a sort of French produced firearm. In fact, it is still a ruby and it is a cover name for Domestos Santos. And this one externally is perhaps sort of a closer to the, uh, the Colt 1903, so the, the granddaddy of all of these, uh, but internally it remains a ruby. Just the safety has moved to the back behind the grip instead of in front. Uh, so we'll get to this little variation later. Now this one, I Gastanaga. Uh, this one has a nice martial trademark there, destroyer of worlds. This one, Zuliaka. Now there's quite a few Zuliaka. I don't know this if it was some kind of dynasty, um, but there's four or five different ones. Uh, I have another Zuliaka as well, but with a different marking. Uh, I suspect this one is probably post-war uh, because of the English safe and fire on the frame and also the finish. But can't prove that. This one has a very nice little scroll script. Fiel, which if I remember correctly, is something like pride or honor. I can't remember which. Oop, cables. Now this one is uh, physically the biggest of the lot. Um, doesn't have any more features or anything, uh, but it is extremely well made. S.A. Alcatasuna, another Guernica made one. They've got their own trademark and everything. Very well made and pretty accurate, actually. 
And then we come to my only Ruby. Very, very battered example that someone at some point made an unfortunate attempt at restoring. Um, there we go. It's a shame because uh, it's got the nicest trigger of the lot and internally it's absolutely fine. There we go. And then we have these lot which are getting gradually harder to see. This one is uh, Bestigui Hermanos. This is the other Suliaca. This one is, I can't even see it. Uh, you'll see a text. And this one's got a couple of weird things going on, which we'll, we'll get to in a sec. And this one we can't see anymore. And here's where it is. So let's take a quick look inside one, since they're all pretty much the same, but not quite. Um, basically, this is as simple as you can get. Simple blowback, of course. What we have here is a trigger with a single uh, transfer bar. So not a, a parallel stirrup like, a, like on a 1903. And a trigger mechanism basically consists of a mainspring pushing up on the hammer and a little pivoting sear here, which has a spring that you can just about see in there biasing it away from the frame towards the trigger. And uh, so when you pull the trigger, pushes against the sear here, trips the hammer. And this is also spring bias. And this thing up here is the disconnector. So that when the slide goes back, as you can see, it pushes the sear out of engagement and it doesn't go full auto. Now, safety here has two functions, locks out the trigger, and also if for any reason you uh, rack the slide, it'll lock back. Uh, what they did was uh, very cleverly made the recoil spring do its job, but also put tension on the safety lever so that uh, It'll be stable-ish in both conditions. Depends on the strength of the recoil spring. Uh, there was an issue. Uh, people found that when drawing it from a holster, it could flick forward as you drew it out. And therefore you find some of them which have a big rivet shoved through the frame here, just so that uh, the holster doesn't brush against the safety as much. But I haven't managed to find one of those. Someday. Um, otherwise, disassembly very, very easy. And just disengage the lugs, the barrel lugs from the frame. Pull out the barrel. And there we have a very modern captive recoil assembly. Now, some people say that these are uh, staked and you can't take them apart, but all the ones I've found are actually, th this end is screwed in and you can just unscrew this and replace the spring because they're quite often quite tired. And the frame is just a big chunk of metal, very little machining needed. There's the firing pin. And then the sights. Uh, will vary from excellent, this one isn't bad, to absolutely horrible. Uh, let's see. Like this one, it's very, very tiny, and the front sight is basically a blade. Uh, so, yeah. Depends on the ones. Uh, sometimes you get lucky. Let's face it you weren't going to be target shooting with these. Now, one of the advantages of having so many rubies is that you start to realize that they have not all been created equal. So uh, watch out, it's about to get nerdy. So they all have slightly different external designs, but that's just slight ergonomic variations. Uh, the slides are all slightly different lengths. Yeah, the rear sight and front sights are all different locations, but 
doesn't really make much difference. Um, I wanted to talk more about the mechanical differences that uh, have slipped in. Uh, the most notable is how the firing pin is fixed. So we have the breech block here and the firing pin is captive inside. And in the uh, Colt 1903, as in this one, there's a pin that goes straight through the frame and there's a little groove in the firing pin body um, which this pin sits in to limit the movement of it. So this one is the uh, most faithful, if you like. Um, most decided that that was somehow too difficult um, and they went for something, in, in my opinion, is actually more difficult and that's putting a pin vertically through the frame again into a cutout in the side of the firing pin to limit the movement. Uh, but even then they didn't decide where it should be put. Um, here it's towards the rear, here it's right at the front. Uh, this one by the way is the pin for the ejector claw. So that's different locations but they all agreed that it should be vertically down. And there's one exception which is this one. Uh, which decided to put simply a screw, a grub screw, up inside again to limit the movement of the firing pin. Now someone uh, thought that this was actually a little bit too much machining. Um, I thought I'd uh, come back to this one as I promised. Now this one has a couple of interesting so external features before I go into the firing pin. Uh, I suspect that this became someone's poaching gun after a while. Uh, they brazed a, uh, what I think is a stock attachment here. So it's threaded and it's got these two little wing supports here to stop it from pivoting. So I expect that someone jury rigged some kind of stock. Maybe it was a battlefield modification, but I highly doubt it. I think uh, someone was using this for hunting bunnies or something. And the second question is to do with the barrel. Now, uh, what you can see sticking out here appears to be the barrel blank. So if I just remove it. So I think this is the original blank diameter. And the rifling is very well done. A good chambering as well. And it shoots no worse than the others. Uh, but what is intriguing is that clearly this had a fourth mounting lug, which has been filed away, and the whole thing has been filed on the outside. Uh, they've filed the shape of the uh, anti-rotation lug here so that uh, it doesn't unlock itself in firing. Uh, so clearly an unfinished project to replace the original barrel, I guess. Um, I don't think this would have flown in, in the, the very, even the very rudimentary quality control they had uh, when shipping out of France. So yeah, this one is a bit of a mystery as to why this happened to it. And now to the firing pin. I need to propel this one forward a bit because it's a uh, hammer protrudes a little bit too much out of the top there and makes it difficult to remove the slide. Anyway, when I got this one, I observed something was odd because there is no visible means to retain the firing pin. Clearly it is, um, but there's no cross pin, no grub screw, nothing. And what they've done, if I poke it out, is that uh, they've shaped the extractor in such a way, I'm trying not to lose the tiny spring there, like so, um, which with this little arm here that pokes through and retains a firing pin uh, in the same way as the pin or the grub screw does. Now, unfortunately, what that means is that what that means is that um, when you fire, there's inevitably going to be a little shock on um, the claw poking in to the firing pin as it gets shoved backwards and forwards. And that means that the your pin slowly travels up in this case. And you can see that uh, 
people have been hammering this pin back down continuously uh, throughout its uh, service life. So it was an interesting shortcut, uh, but um, it had its reasons why it wasn't carried over to anything else. So next we have uh, this one, which I reckon is my, the best of the lot. Now this one is very special because they have uh, actually gone relatively faithful to the original um, mechanism. Um, they have a V-spring in here, like the Colt does, instead of a, a coil spring. Um, there is also a sliding mag catch, horizontally sliding, rather than the normal pivoting one. which greatly eases disassembly because this the the, the massive coil spring they usually have uh, is makes it extremely difficult to put everything back together um, also they have this separate um, sear transfer bar i guess so you've got the trigger transfer bar and now you have a sear transfer bar um, and that means that um, this also acts as a disconnector so once you reach end of travel, it automatically slips off this transfer bar um, and there's no thing poking up the top to do it and it works fine. Um, basically this, the sear needs very very little travel to trip the trigger. So there's plenty where well, you inevitably have to over travel enough with your trigger pull that it slips off. So. That was a very clever system. Uh, this takes a bit of machining though. So uh, probably again, there's a reason why this wasn't adopted by others. No doubt it was probably patented inside Spain as well. So uh, no one else could, um, but it's a very clever idea. So last variation so far is uh, this uh, cute little Domesto Santos with its weird safety here. Clearly aftermarket grips, by the way, but someone clearly loved their little pistol. Um, so instead of being here at the front and simply working on the trigger and being slide lock, it's moved to the back, still works as a slide lock, um, more of a faithful position as in the 1903, except this works on the hammer rather than working on the sear. So there is a notch in the rear surface of the hammer here so that when the hammer is cocked and you engage the safety, it uh, engages with this slot at the back of the hammer and holds it captive. So trigger is still free to move, but nothing happens. However, you can also set it, so if I disengage it there. I'll do this slowly because if I do it fast, then uh, the spring shoots out the back here when the, it's not hitting the firing pin. So if I set the safety here, you can see it's got a little bar there at the back with some milled slots in it. So in this position, hammer is uh, not cocked. And if you try and rack the slide, hammer moves back, but it's blocked. The full travel isn't possible. It stops to here, which means you can't slide, you can't uh, uh, rack the slide or chamber around. So uh, interesting solution. I don't know whether that was an intention or nor a consequence of, uh, of putting it here. And you thought that was over. Well, so did I. However, I noticed something else when I was reassembling everything. Uh, that concerns a, a variation on the ejector. So normally it is this rib here, which is pinned in place, you just see it there. And you can see it's a separate part here on the top. You can see here on this one, another separate part there. Uh, and then I noticed this Izaha, so the star one, has uh, a separate part which is still pinned in place, but simply slots into the frame. So uh, more easily re replaceable, in fact. So one of the major criticisms levelled against the Ruby um, is that there is a complete lack of interchangeability between magazines and the pistols. So uh, the pistols were each delivered with three magazines and 
and that's all you got when uh, you were out in the field. You got uh, your three magazines were filled, and that's it. And there was no reloads. Uh, and the holsters are designed to hold the two mags plus one the gun. So that's it. Um, and it often stated that uh, if your uh, mag doesn't match, or if the maker on the bottom of the magazine doesn't match, you have no hope of it fitting in another ruby. Uh, so I want to test that theory. So here are all the magazines I have. You can see there's a huge variation in the design and thickness of the floor plate. Uh, these three, I'm lucky enough to have a complete set. So three plus the pistol, as it would have been issued. And the rest are random. Some of them don't even have markings at all. So uh, I have machined myself some uh, 32 ACP dummies. And what we're going to do is just mix them up and see if they randomly fit and feed in a random pistol. So, uh, let me see. This one and uh, this one. So, well, these ones. This one matches, so that won't do. Uh, let's see. These are and an IG. Bits, locks in, feeds, ejects. So far, so good. Put that one aside. Uh, that one, no name. Uh, let's have that one. Just locks in. Feeds. Whoop! Little eject. Failure to eject. But it feeds. And uh, next, do let's have this one. Another IG with Erkigyaga Fiel Fits Lock back, safety's on Feeds and ejects and This is another IG, so let's, let's try Alcatasuna Gets in there, feeds, ejects, uh, what have we got here, a no name, let's try that one over there, and that is Erustondo, bits in there, feeds, ejects, And we got here AK. I don't know what that one is. Fits nicely. Feeds. Ejects. And what's that? R E H E something like that. These ejects. And a different H-E-R-E, -E. I know that one came with this one, so that'd be cheating. I uh, don't think I've tried that one, have I? So this is H-E going into Z-C. Oh, this one's tight. So, let's eliminate that one. So, one out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh. Eight in total, inserted into random pistols, and only one didn't, wasn't compatible. So uh, I wouldn't call it all that bad. So in terms of accoutrements, it wasn't really until 1916 that this official pattern came out. Uh, it's a very simple triangular shaped uh, holster. This one is restored, so the front and back, and tab, and buckle the original, and the rest I have replaced with some fresh leather um, and inside you have a little pouch set with the dividers for the two supplementary mags. <clears throat> uh, this one happens to have a strap so I'm guessing this one was for an officer. Very short strap because of course you had the high-waisted belts back then uh, but you see them coupled with the conventional infantry ammunition pouch on the left 
Uh, you see various pictures of trench raiders and so on uh, with this type of uh, holster. Um, these carried on in service way past. Uh, they were still in service in World War II. I've seen some which have been adapted on the back to the new webbing system in 1935. So it would have like this right hand pouch, it would have this new uh, buckle, uh, D ring underneath for attaching the water bottle or um, haversack, and they would have an extra tab here so you can link it to the other pouch. So they saw, these saw a great deal of service. And this one is a homemade one uh, for, especially for lefties, because I can. Um, I actually made this before I got that, and uh, I got pretty close. Just made it a little bit longer than the, than the original, but otherwise pretty close. And you can see what it's like inside, as usual, with the holsters of the time, not intended for a quick draw. So there we are, pistol fits in nice and snug. And two magazines are in there. Now there was also another pattern of pouch in World War One, and that is this one. Some of you may recognize it as my uh, Mad Minute uh, cartridge pouch. What it is in fact is a uh, ruby uh, pouch, when we say holster, for Shosha gunners. So if everything went to poop um, they could uh, gradually draw out their holster from this on the in the small of their back and uh, try and scare people away off to withdraw and again we have the two mag holders in there and room for the pistol sitting on top like so uh, there would also be normally a, a cleaning rod and rags in here as well and uh, it all fits in nicely, like so. And at the back you have the normal loops for the wide belt and for the, uh, the main stem of the Y webbing belt. Okay chap, now please shut up and shoot. Well, here we are, we've come to the shooting bit of the video, but I haven't finished waffling. Um, what I've decided to do is a shoot at uh, 15 meters, one-handed of course, because that was what you did back then. And um, so I chose 15 because basically it's the expected distance more or less that these would be shot at. They're self-defense, uh, personal protection pistols, and uh, it's sort of a happy medium between the sort of average US pistol range and the standard European 25 uh, pistol distance. Um, so, uh, this was taken over the virus period, so ranges of bond have been open spontaneously on and off, so I've just been going, grabbing one or two pistols and having a go. So there's all sorts of footage. I, won't, I haven't shown them all, don't worry, there's not what, 12 different things, and some of them I'll just show you the targets. So, enjoy! First up, the destroyer, 15 meters and a silhouette target. So next up is the uh, 1914 pattern. Again, five rounds, 15 meters on the uh, poor old chap over there. Ja, 
Huh? Okay, next up, Yazada. Just out of curiosity, Quasimodo here. And just for comparison's sake, the unique. So there we go, not too bad. Now clear, not target guns, but uh, perfectly adequate when you're in a tight spot. So uh, what happened to these rubies after World War I? Well, the majority of them just carried on service um, through the interwar, into World War II and beyond. Well into the 60s, uh, then obviously gradually replaced with the uh, Mac 50 and so on. Um, however, immediately post-World War I, uh, France managed to sell off a significant number to uh, Finland, who were in a similar tight spot as France was pre-World War I, and needed guns quick uh, for them Russians. And uh, so you'll find some that have a little tiny SA mark on them. Um, basically, I think the deal went like this. Would you like some guns? We have lots of rubies. Guns, anything. Yes, we'll buy them. In comes shipment of guns. I'll let you translate that. Uh, yeah, so they, they were used. Clearly they knew they were somewhat inferior and um, they basically said, oh, Lugers instead. But uh, these were still uh, saw action and apparently they stayed at least in storage well into the 60s. So uh, yeah, foreign service for the ruby. Now, in terms of the ruby itself, uh, it actually didn't stop evolving, if you like. It was, you know, part of French gun culture by then. And uh, Unique, uh, which uh, if you saw my vid on the uh, X51 bis semi-auto carbine, uh, you'll know is down the west coast of France, uh, southwest, so very close to Eibar, Basque country. And um, they carried on producing it. This is the Model 17, Unique. Basically, they keep exactly the same mechanism, just with this time peacetime quality manufacturing. And they uh, also add in a magazine safety because it was popular at the time. And uh, these saw uh, service in military, in the uh, police agencies, uh, you know, bank protection, rail guards, that kind of thing. Um, they also saw uh, German service under the occupation. And they were also produced under, uh, under the Germans. And they also then, under German control, developed this a little bit further into what would ultimately become the uh, RR-51 police, which is a uh, slightly reduced version, very slightly smaller. Uh, however, it weighs about the same, even slightly more. And it's got this very pronounced bulge on the back with deep grooves. Um, which means it's pretty stable in the hand and uh, if you grip it properly you end up with a groove in, in your palm. Uh, so this one has an external hammer but the internals are the same so basically it's, it's unshrouded like on this one and uh, give it a, a bit of a nicer line and also what they included on this one is 
you can have a uh, a lock of the slide in the last round, which is nice. Uh, it's basically just on the magazine, but at least you know when you're empty. Uh, and these uh, went into police use uh, quite heavily, and basically they were only definitively withdrawn in uh, 2002 when uh, the SIG Pro, SIG 2022, uh, was then brought into service for um, sort of non for police and uh, gendarmerie and customs and so on. And before I leave you, there's just one little anecdote that uh, I picked up thanks to Salul Mir on the Facebook, and that is the history of the ruby in French Indochina, because of course these were in use throughout the empire. And there apparently they were known as gabies, uh, simply because Gabilonzo Iuresti was the predominant manufacturer, uh, so they were became all known a sort of military slang as gabbies and it then permeated so far as to be the uh, generic term for any Spanish produced handgun, whatever it was. So even the llamas, uh, 1911s copies, etc. They were all gabbies. So there we go. Uh, I hope that was uh, vaguely interesting and um, I shall see you then very soon on another episode here in the workshop or on the range. Uh, thank you, of course, uh, for all your support. Uh, whatever medium you choose to follow us on and of course especially to our patrons who uh, enable us to carry on so thank you and see you next time and for comparison's sake 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 the unique